So in this video, I'll be talking about my experience with barefoot minimalist shoes and in particular talking about some of the problems that I encountered along the way trying to make that transition and some of the solutions that I found that helped me smooth that transition out over the last couple of years. But even if you've already made up your mind about barefoot shoes, I think that integrating some of these things will be great for your foot health in the long run anyway. And that means that you can continue to hike and walk and climb injury free, hopefully well into old age. And that's pretty much what this channel was about, longevity in the mountains. Let's get into it. So real quick, let's go over exactly what constitutes a barefoot shoe. In my mind, there are four things that really differentiate barefoot shoes from regular shoes, and that is that they are wider, they are flatter, so they offer less support, they are thin, meaning there's less protection, and then finally that they are zero drop, meaning there's no difference between the heel height and the forefoot height. And when you begin spending more time barefoot or wearing minimal shoes, your body has to adapt to all four of those changes. So that means that if you're like me pushing 40 and you've been wearing shoes since you were, I don't know, three or four years of age, that means you've got about 35 years of foot punishment you've got to undo regardless of whether you want to integrate minimal footwear or not. And given how long it's taken for your foot to adapt to wearing a tight restricted shoe, it's unreasonable to expect that the body will be able to play catch up in such a short amount of time just by wearing the shoe. So in this video, I'm gonna go through four things from each one of those categories that will help you transition to barefoot quicker and avoid the injuries that often come along with the transition to minimal footwear or injuries that just happen to us anyway for any number of reasons. So first up, let's talk protection or in the minimal case, lack of it. And this is incredibly important for us as hikers in particular. I mean, no one wants to experience their foot being punctured by anything. And when you're out in the wilderness hiking or running, that's certainly a possibility, but I would argue the chance of actually getting punctured for something directly from the ground into your foot is actually pretty low, at least from my experience. But what's more common is the fear of or complaints of the foot copping an absolute beating from anything on the trail, whether it be rocks or roots or anything else we encounter. And I think that's one of the main reasons why people have maybe tried barefoot shoes and then decided it's not for them because simply their feet just copped a beating from the trail and it's pretty uncomfortable, at least initially. But what I've begun to do as I transitioned into a minimal shoe is to condition the bottom of my feet over time so that it's become more accustomed to getting pressure from below. And this runs in line with one of the most crucial things that I've learned from foam rolling and doing tissue work and self massage. And that's that tight and stiff, weak muscles, they hurt to pressure. Whereas muscles that are strong and supple they don't hurt to pressure. So if you are experiencing pain from the bottom of the foot in any type of footwear, it's likely that the muscles in the bottom of the foot are weak and stiff and they need to be released if we're going to find optimal foot health. So what can we do to help release that tight and weak muscle? Well, the regular thing to do is to get a trigger point ball, but you could also just use a golf ball. I like to also use a broomstick at home, or if I'm out on the trail, I'll just use the handle of my trekking poles. And the idea here is that you place as much pressure as you comfortably can, allowing the foot to kind of drape over that implement, allowing the bones and the muscles and the ligaments and the fascia to move around. So you can start by just placing a little bit of pressure into the bottom of the foot, into the ball, just rolling up and down for one minute, and then another minute just going side to side. So this technique combined with slowly integrating more and more time on trails and more and more time in minimal footwear means that the bottom of your feet can slowly become accustomed to those sensations and the pressure from anything coming through any type of footwear. And that sensory information that we get from the bottom of the feet is actually really important. So this has everything to do with how often you fall, you know, whether you've got good balance skills, and they're obviously incredibly important things when we're in the mountains. And one of the great things about minimal footwear is the increase in proprioception and balance, which eventually leads to less falls and less accidents because we're able to stay upright and perceive our surroundings through our feet. And even if you've never had any foot problems and your feet are fine, that's not necessarily an indication that things are going well. The feet are capable of putting up with a whole bunch of neglect before we start to get symptoms like plantar fasciitis or any number of other foot and knee ailments that could impact our time in the mountains. And I've had plantar fasciitis and it is not fun, so prevention is better than cure. 
Okay, let's talk about support because this is the one thing that people are always concerned about and I totally understand that. If you're out by yourself when you roll or sprain an ankle, it's gonna be pretty difficult to get yourself out of that situation. And to be honest, if you started wearing barefoot shoes and you went out for a hike, that's quite a likely possibility. Because after decades of wearing shoes with ankle support and arch support, and without performing any drills to help the foot reorganize itself to form its own arch, then that's likely to cause problems and or make your transition to barefoot extremely slow and probably painful. And this is where I think a lot of people just tend to give up on the barefoot thing because it's too hard. So to combat that, there's a couple of things we can do. Firstly, what I did is I started to integrate as much of my exercise as possible being barefoot. Secondly, I started to actively create an arch in my own foot whilst I was doing those exercises. And this is a concept known as foot doming or short foot, where you actively try and create your own arch using the muscular structure of your legs and in particular the deep frontal line, the line of fascia that runs from your pelvic floor all the way down to your big toe. So in order to do this, it's useful to start with your feet directly under your hips and press those long flexes of your toes lightly into the floor, thereby anchoring the toes to the ground. From there, it's useful to think about generating torque from the hips. So I like to imagine there's a crack in the ground between my two feet and I'm trying to externally rotate my feet and really spread apart that crack in the ground. And at the same time, we exhale and lift the pelvic floor up. So the way we do that is thinking pee in, poop in. And not everyone will see this immediately, but over time and with practice and reintegration, you should see a lifting of the medial arch in the foot, meaning that yes, you can recreate your own arch, or at least in most cases you can. One more important thing that I should point out is that if you're doing this correctly, you'll have the arch in the foot which will extend to your first metatarsal. So the big bone at the front of your foot, that should actually be off the ground. So really think about weighting the outside, the lateral parts of your feet. And then you can integrate this short foot technique into every exercise you do. You can squat with short foot, you can deadlift, you can lunge, you can stand and do a knee drive, which happens to be one of the best exercises for bulletproofing the knee and also boosting ankle mobility. It's really a one-stop shop. So for me, when I know I'm doing this correctly is that I'll feel this deep connection from my pelvic floor all the way down into the ground and I feel like I'm a tree. I feel like I'm connected to the ground. It sounds very hippie, but if you imagine yourself like tree roots with your toes spreading out to the ground, that's how you know you're doing it right, as long as it's coming all the way up into the pelvic floor. And if you're struggling with this initially, which you probably will, it's best to just do this standing. I like to teach it in a hip hinge. So don't try and do any complex exercises at first. Just start by trying to draw power up from the ground as if you're a tree. So what has all this got to do with hiking and walking and climbing? Well, having an arch in the foot enables the foot to do its natural intended purpose, which is to be a spring, meaning that you will spend less energy, you will have less pressure on your knees, and you will hike more efficiently if you're able to create that arch because your foot is just acting like a spring. And believe me, everything gets a lot easier from that point if you have a good strong arch. Now that is a very brief explanation of quite a complex topic, so I would encourage you to research it, practice it, integrate it, and if you want, you can check out some of my other routines where I give you these cues and you can follow along and start creating that arch on your own. I would recommend starting with this video. Okay, now let's talk width in wide shoes, my personal favorite. One of the easiest concepts to understand about wide barefoot shoes is that they enable the toes to spread out, to splay naturally, as opposed to being trapped within a skinny restrictive shoe that's honestly just designed to look nice rather than being functional. But from my experience, simply wearing a shoe doesn't necessarily mean that your toes are gonna to follow along and start playing out naturally. For example, when you wear a sock, that tends to restrict the toe movement as well, which is why so many people in the barefoot community opt for wearing Injinji socks. But if you've tried Injinjis and you're just really not down for it, then one other thing you can do is try toe spreaders. In fact, that's probably gonna be even worse. So <laughs> one thing you can integrate is something that I call a toe glove. And it's really simple. All we do is we try and integrate our hand into our toes. Now this is gonna be difficult at first, especially if you've been wearing tight footwear for a while. But essentially what we're trying to do is just slide 
uh, the fingers into the toes so that the webbing matches. And then from there, we can start to mobilize, we can start to grab the toes, move them around in all sorts of directions. As long as you're not experiencing any pain during this, it's absolutely fine and safe to do. And this is one thing that I do just about every night when I sit down at camp, is try and mobilize my toes and get things moving again. Because even though I am wearing predominantly white shoes, the toes still need some love and they need a little bit of massage and some support, especially when you're doing big miles. So try that out, let me know how you go. Okay, finally, we're gonna look at zero drop or heel drop. So let's clarify exactly what we mean by that. Well, an eight mil drop would equate to the heel being eight millimeters higher than the forefoot. And this essentially means that the shoe is creating eight millimeters of false ankle mobility for you, which may seem like a good thing. I mean, ankle mobility pops up in just about every functional movement pattern, but the catch is that having a higher heel forces more weight onto the forefoot. This can cause all kinds of problems. One of the key ones is that over time, it can cause shortening of the tissues and the posterior chain, which explains why a lot of people can't touch their toes. So we've got tight calves and tight hamstrings. But what's even more pressing is if you don't have that ankle mobility, the body will find a way. It will create a shortcut always. And generally what tends to happen is that the feet will uh, externally rotate out to the side to enable the heel to pass over. And also what you'll tend to see is the big toe pointing laterally. So it's essentially getting squashed as you're rolling internally rather than walking with your feet straight. And this is a really good thing to do. Just check out your own gait. Next time you're walking, see if your feet are pointing directly straight or maybe one's out laterally, maybe both are out laterally. It's likely you've got limited ankle mobility. So check in with your gait by watching your feet while you're walking, have a look at the big toe, and then finally test your ankle mobility. And in general, we should be aiming for at least 35 degrees of dorsiflexion in the ankle for functional human movement, especially when it comes to hiking, walking, and running. So not only does that heel drop not solve the underlying problem of limited ankle mobility, it's also likely a huge cause of it. So how do we tackle ankle mobility well because of the complex nature of the foot and the role that other muscles play in ankle dorsiflexion it can take some experimentation and some effort and some time and some learning but the one thing I will say is just if you can hit in range on your ankle mobility every single day that's going to go a long way to help you boost your ankle mobility over time if you're not sure if you've got tight ankles or if you know that you have them and you really want to attack this as a problem I would download my mountain proof ankles routine. It's completely free. It's a PDF with a bunch of videos and some tests so you can start problem solving this. So for me, I think the greatest thing that I've taken away from this learning experience of transitioning into barefoot is just getting a tiny understanding of how incredibly complex the structure of the foot is. So a quote from Leonardo da Vinci, the foot is a masterpiece of engineering and a work of art. And I think that's a good place to end on this video. Thanks for watching. I'll see you on the summit.